All right, good morning, everyone. I'd like to call to order the, what's today? February 22nd, 2023 meeting of the Capital Improvements Committee. We've had our safety briefing. Uh, first item on the agenda is uh, approval of the December 14 minutes. I'll entertain a motion. Dr. Brayman moves, Connie, uh, Ms. Hall seconds, all in favor. The, it is unanimous to approve the December minutes. Next item on the agenda, approval of today's agenda. Ms. Hall moves, Dr. Brayman seconds, all in favor. It is anonymous, I mean unanimous. <laughs> Okay, people, are, I'm just making sure people were listening. <laughs> For the minutes, it was unanimous that today's agenda be approved. And with that, uh, let's move on to East Lost Expenditures and Budget. Mr. Daniel, are you presenting today? Excellent. Well, good morning. East Plus revenues for East Plus 4 through December uh, 2022 was $118,209,905.17. The actual collections for the month of December has been our highest yet. We had um, we collected $11,731,869,000. An average um, for the past 12 months of $10,225,000 per month. So, uh, just so I'm reading this correctly, we're averaging seven, four, eight, four. We're averaging almost three million dollars more in collections than we did in 2019. Correct. Per month, yes, sir. Wow. <laughs> well, okay. Yes, but as I, but I, eggs cost a lot of money. Yeah. I will remind you, as you reminded us in December, that enjoy these months because we don't know what's coming up in the future. I hear you, but three million more a month is. That's why hotel rooms are seven hundred dollars a night downtown. <laughs> exactly. Yes, sir. Um, the um, tax revenue collections. Um, we have a budget of, as um, Mr. Cashmore just said, $7 million per month, and um, we are well above that at this time each month. East Flush. Is, is there a law that we cannot, we can only make so much money on our East Flush initiative that once we would get to that, it would. Uh, or it, there's no cap. Our last referendum, we said we were going for four hundred and twenty million dollars. Um, so it's five years or four hundred and twenty million dollars, whichever comes first. Would be mm, yes, but it's up to um, the state to cut us off when we reach those limits. And fortunately for us, for East Wash Three, they did not cut us off, so we were above. So. But that is, the referendum is 420 million. Okay. Thank you. I, I like to add a caveat to that. <clears throat> they also allow you to, if your expenditures increase, to take that additional revenues to uh, use that. For example, uh, when the forest, we budgeted 58 million, it is at 92 million. So we expect to see some increases. Uh, for all our projects, so those additional revenues can go towards that as well. Thank you. Not can, will. <laughs> uh, next on the, um, in our packet, we have the unallocated um, East Lodge 2, collect, um, unallocated funds. At the end of December, we were sitting at $1,849,000 in unallocated funds in East Blush 2. Um, East Blush 2, um, we've done all of our collections on there, but um, 
We have um, our spendings so far is $406 million, well, almost $407 million, with a balance right now of $4,448,000 in that fund. East Splash 3, um, our budget was $447 million um, to date through December. Well, we've got $368 million collect, um, that we've spent with a balance of $78 million. East Splash 4, um, we're at $20 million in spending on that with a balance right now $399 million in the budget. East Watch 2 revenues, um, all of the collections have been done on that, but we, with money still sitting in the bank, we are earning interest on those funds. Um, to date, in East Watch 2, we've collected $2,727,000 in interest income on the funds that we've had in that account. Um, East Watch 3, collections have been completed on that also. Um, our interest on that account, um, through December is $9,561,000. East Splash 4, um, interest income, we um, had a budget for the five years of $1.5 million. Through, through now, we've got, we've, we've surpassed that um, $1.5 million interest income budget. We're at $1,527,000 in interest income in East Wash 4. So that concludes the um, revenue portion of East Wash um, for this month. If anyone has any additional questions? Thank you. And the expenditure reports are in there as well. If anyone has specific questions, uh, we can circle back with the team. Anyone? If you have anything later, let us know. All right, thank you. Moving on, um, operations. Good morning. We will, Good morning. We will proceed um, with the next presentation relative to long range facility, our master plan. Uh, we had discussion in our last board meeting doing informal and wanted to continue that discussion. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to the members of the capital projects team. Yeah, good morning. Uh, as we presented, uh, Parson presented our long range facility plan, master plan, uh, we had some guiding principles. And in that, I just want to go back over, over those, which was student population, program location, 21st century design. You're going to see some of that in our presentation later on uh, in this presentation. ADA compliance, which means that if we do any type of major upgrades, then we have to upgrade all the ADA in that particular building as well. Equitable distribution, just making sure that we're putting our resources where, you know, the FCI score says that we need to put them on our capital assets. Our community input, just like this meeting and all the, the other meetings that we have from a capital project standpoint, ensuring that the community are engaged uh, with what we do. LMWB opportunities, uh, as you know, in East Los 3, uh, we did a lot of hard bidding, which at that point in time, does not allow you to really give opportunities to local and minority contractors because basically a hard bid is basically uh, they select the team. We changed that uh, uh, delivery method to CMR on E4, which allows us to uh, give opportunities to local and minority opportunities. And then the last one is facilities, which uh, we're looking at maintenance and operations, a lot of sustainability, as you heard, E uh, the EV buses, as well as we incorporate uh, uh, solar panels on all of our schools, and then uh, there's healthy and safety, which you will hear some of that later on today. 
So again, the facility condition index is just an assessment tool. It's, it's a way for us to gauge the condition of our buildings. And we're, we would like to have all our buildings at uh, 0 to 15%, which is a good score. Uh, however, you know, 15 to 30% is the range where most of our buildings should fall. And if it's unsatisfactory, you're going to see our plan for how we're going to get those up into the 15 to 30% range. Some of the deficiency areas that we really want to uh, talk about. If a system is a critical system, which is our HVAC roof, uh, fire alarm system, data communication system, we immediately uh, got a plan to fix those. Those are what we call warm, safe, and dry. Uh, some of our non-critical systems, not saying they're not, not important, but painting, flooring, ceiling, plumbing fixtures, and restroom accessories are those that fall in that category. So here's the breakout. Uh, for all of our facilities, that's include our maintenance and all our auxiliary uh, facilities, uh, 20 of those are in the good, uh, four of those are in the fair, 24 is in the poor, and 10 is unsatisfactory. I would just remind you that most of the facilities that's in unsatisfactory are some of our support facilities. Those support facilities does not get any capital outlay funding, and so uh, the board and the district has to pay all of those costs out of, out of pocket. So uh, that's like maintenance, that's like Whitney, that's like Massey, uh, uh, those type facilities. And here's a breakdown. I won't go through all of these, but here's how uh, every school rack and stack. And here's our needs, here's our forecast needs. And basically what this is saying that if, you know, if we don't put any funding uh, to these particular schools, no funding at all, by 2031, most of our schools will be in the unsatisfactory category. So, and we know that's not going to happen because we do have a plan. And here's where it will be if we decide to put uh, our funding as we have presented it to you guys. Uh, most of our schools will be in the fair category. Question on this slide, is this just East Block's expenditures or general fund ongoing maintenance expenditures as well? This is just uh, East Block's expenditures, uh, no consideration for ongoing maintenance. Uh, this is all East, East Block's and this is all critical asset items as well. So it's not the ongoing paint fixtures no. Okay. So that information is available in the facilities condition assessment. That deferred maintenance budget yeah. is, is there. So the question I've got for budgeting purposes is what, what do we need to spend on a yearly maintenance basis so that all of our schools don't get into the red or pink? They're in the yellow or green consistently. And that's, um, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And, and that's the data that we'll be bringing forward as we start preparing for the upcoming budget cycle by site, by category, using the data that we have received back from, from our contractor. Thank you. Ms. Grabowski? I'm just going back to a question, I mean, a um, statement you made a minute, a minute ago about the capital outlay that's not available for our support facilities. And you mentioned Massey. I know we don't have classes that meet on a regular basis at Massey, but it is an integral part of our education system where schools do receive education from Massey. So is it because the students are not in the building at all times that it's not eligible for capital outlay dollars? Yeah, in order to receive capital outlay dollars, you have to be an instructional unit. It has to be okay. a instructional unit, and that's how you get funding. It also has to be part of your academic inventory. So Massey is considered one of our support facilities, uh, just like this building, and so it would not receive any capital outlay because, one, it does not have any uh, instructional units, and that's how the state regulates, and then number two, it is not a DEMA academic institution facility. It's too bad because it's an important part of our academic curriculum, I think, and provides great benefits to our students. But 
we have Oakland Island now where we have our younger students in that facility mm -hmm. and, and they are thriving, but based on that instructional unit requirement from the state. Now, certainly we pick up the phone and we call um, Mickey frequently, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, and pose those exact questions and we'll continue to do it because in our district as we expand and you see us moving out into those non-traditional mm -hmm. um, brick and mortar, 20 classrooms in a building, we're doing some things a little differently in our district. Yeah, so we continue to pose that and bring it forward. And it'd be great to see if there are other districts that are doing similar so that we can kind of advocate collectively to the state because um, I think that gives us so much more flexibility to be able to meet the needs of our community. So thanks for continuing to ask the questions. It's the same, way, same um, scenario as the lower with the autonomous as well. So it's, it's just not massive. It's other facilities that we just um, can't deem as instructional. Right. And this is the average FCI scores that we just talked about. And we had some conversation about capacity and utilization uh, and adequate, inadequate space greater than 110 percent that causes stress on the on the uh, most of the critical systems. Uh, when you put more kids into a building that is not designed for that that building, as well as the inefficient space when you don't have enough kids in the building, you run all the systems and uh, your cost of that building goes up. But we did go back, uh, based upon the conversation that we had, uh, we went back and we looked at how we use our buildings from a capacity and utilization standpoint. Because like at Savannah High, uh, it may be not uh, utilized to what the state said it needs to be, but we wanted a smaller classroom size. So we took all of that into consideration. And just to reiterate, the charts on 65 and 66 are only based on the building assessment standing alone. Doesn't take into account geography, academic program, policy decisions about class size and all that. That, that is correct. Okay. Uh, the, on page 67, that's why we took right. all that information but, into consideration. Yeah, I just think it's important for anybody watching or the media to understand this is a building standing alone. It doesn't take into account what we actually are trying to do as a district from a vision and policy standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. So on page 67, this is a perfect example of what you talked about, Mr. Kashmar. Uh, Charles Ellis K-8 is the monastery school. And so uh, from a utilization standpoint, uh, we took a look at that. Uh, the consultants say close or repurpose it. We said renovate it because of how that particular school is utilized. Okay. Uh, Jacob G. Smith, again, renovate, and I won't read all the lists, but uh, some of the ones that uh, we did agree with the consultant was uh, Schumann uh, in terms of the uh, FCI score and the utilization rate. Uh, the other one that we agreed with them, uh, had a disagreement, uh, was Bloomingdale. Uh, they said renovate that, but uh, we all know that uh, Hyundai plant is coming and that that particular area is going to explode. And so we need to do something in that particular area as it relates to rebuilding that school and get the FTE up in there. Uh, so this is our recommendation uh, as we got the guidance back from the board. And uh, we went back and took a look at those. And we will be bringing those forward to you probably in April for a resolution to support the uh, master plan. Mr. Bozeman and Ms. Miller Kegler, can you can you please clarify what what operations means by renovate versus repurpose versus relocate versus rebuild? I think I know what those words mean, but I want to make sure we're on the same page. All right, so renovate means that we would go in there and we would use our uh, capital outlay dollars or we would use our East Watch program to go in there to uh, all the critical systems, bring all those systems up to uh, where you need to be. If it says closed, and then basically what we're saying is put together a closure plan somewhere between the next five years. And it's not saying that we're going to close it right now, but within the next five years, we need to look at closing that facility. If it said repurpose that facility, what we're saying is that on that particular facility, uh, for, uh, for example, Largo, Tibet, it's in a floodplain area. So what we're saying is that if we're going to put dollars in that particular facility, 
let's repurpose that facility for auxiliary space or other uses that we can po possibly get out of that particular facility. Uh, if it's a relocate, then what we're saying that is we need to find a bigger space for that particular facility uh, in order to execute the plan that we have in place. For example, uh, Gamble Road Maintenance. Maintenance share that building with uh, all of our buses. And if you put all our buses on one location with maintenance, then that facility is not large enough. So we're saying that we need to probably go out there and find a larger facility for maintenance and the bus operation if that's what we want to continue to do. And rebuild is basically uh, tear down and start over. Ms. Hall? Um, I, I know we had voted uh, monies to repair Gamble Road and all. So you're saying now rather than do that, let's find a totally new place for it. So we're going ahead and doing all of the major repairs that we talked about in three. So we're doing that asphalt. We're going to do that on Gamble Road. Uh, improvements to the project like that does not hurt it. But what we're saying in a five-year plan, the optimum plan, we bring in EV buses, which we're going to need support for all of those. Uh, right now, we have uh, lost our lot that's on Chatham Parkway, so a lot of our buses is not located in the facility that we need. And if we're going to combine all our buses, all our maintenance facilities and everything like that, within the next five years, we probably need a bigger space because neither space on Gamble or Interchange is large enough to handle all of the buses and the bus operations. However, we feel that it's necessary for our employees to continue to make sure that uh, the environment that they're in, that we continue to do that as we look for another place. Because it takes two to three years in order to uh, go out and build a new facility. So that plan was already approved by you guys to go ahead and, mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that the facilities are where they need to be. And so we're going ahead and doing that as well as trying to locate another facility to combine operations. what we refer to as three parked out for buses just based on the sheer number of buses that we had. And we're paying about $8,000 a month to park buses on Chatham Parkway. With property in that area now, that cost went up to close to $60,000 a month. So we were able to take half of those buses and relocate them over to the Port Wentworth area where we own that land, where we own that property. And that's probably going to be temporary just based on the condition of that land. We're going to probably go in and gravel it, probably do some paving so we can keep them there as long as we can. So those are the things that we're trying to plan out in advance of because these are the things that we're having to contend with. Certainly we have to be prepared for those electric buses that are being um, manufactured for us right now, being able to have a suitable site. Um, that transportation yesterday, the, the road construction makes it much easier for the drivers. There's ample space for their vehicles and their buses to be shared, as well as the construction that's ongoing for the training center that was over on Gamble Road, and now it's going to be over on Interchange Court. So we're working based on that plan after we had an opportunity to share that with you to put it together. So based on conditions that change, then we have to be ready to change and pivot as well, but it is ongoing. And wanted to go back quickly to slide 66 when we had the discussion about capacity and utilization and that we had determined a standard as a part of this report, but we're doing some actual work on it. We're actually going through each of those charter, not each of those choice programs because in a school, and I'll use Garrison as an example, that was built for as an elementary. We converted it to a choice program for the arts, which means we had to then construct dance labs, choir rooms, and band rooms. So what may have been one instructional unit, one classroom, it could now conceivably, three instructional units were used for the dance room, for the band room, for the art room. So we're actually walking and 
um, communication with um, our partners here to make sure we have that actual, because it's important that we communicate the number of seats that are available in those programs. So that's coming forward. We're working through that data to make sure that we can get that accurate information as well. So I wanted to remind you, based on our conversation from the presentation, that is an effort that we're working on, and we're working it from our end as well as with the, um, with the Parsons group as well. Okay. Mr. Rowski? I just, I just want to clarify, because that's really, I think what you just said is really important. So what we have in our packet is what's taken directly out of the Parsons report, and what you're doing right now is tailoring it to reflect our academic programs in each of the schools. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's important because, you know, when you look at it and look at availability, um, I'm on a wait list, but you're telling me you have 12 right. classrooms. No, we want to be able to get as close and as accurate as possible, so that's an initiative that we're working on. Dr. Howard Hall? Has anyone been paying attention? I'm quite sure you have it with, with what's going on at Rice Creek what's going on in Port Wentworth, especially Highway 21, they are actually um, in the process of building a subdivision of for rental houses. And I'm told that the um, Hyundai population probably will be moving out there. And I know that Rice Creek School is pretty much at capacity now. And as we have schools that are under um, utilization, they're on the east side. So how can we fix that problem? What's going on now on the west side? Although the property enrollment has um, declined, the push is more, more so over on the west side. And, and that's a part of um, our initiative when I shared with you that we um, had a single topic, single focus retreat for the cabinet. And a, and a big part of that, a major part of it was right sizing. We need to take a serious look and make some very courageous decisions about right size in this district. Where you see your population shift, where you see your need for seats, where you see us talk about repurposing, and when we talk about closure, it's a cycle. It's not we're going to close today, but how can we right size now based on the data that we have, just as you communicated that we're aware of. Um, because we, we received the information from all of the commissions that are approving building permits. But we want to be able to bring back a plan for your consideration to right size. We called it redistricting back in the day. It's not always the most appealing, but we have to be realistic about, one, how we are allocating our capital assets, how we are managing to be more efficient and effective. When you have a school that's at 46% of capacity, that's inefficient because we can't bring down half of the building relative to utilities. So that's the data that we are we're putting together. That's the data that we'll be bringing forward. So we are continuing to work. Um, just like at Godly Station, we're adding on to that particular mm -hmm. school. You'll see us talk about that. So then we're going to have to look at we do have ample land at Rice Creek. We may have to make some modifications. Then we'll be looking at how we can fund that as well. So we are, we are aware, we're looking at how we can look at what's on our plan right now, where there is funding, and if we need to go in and make the adjustment, which you are well aware, whenever we've had a school that may have been originally programmed for 800, oftentimes we've increased it. So we're looking at what's on the table now that's funded, and if we have an opportunity to increase that, then that's going to be the recommendations that's going to be coming forward. Dr. Brain, then Ms. Hall. Um, this, you're saying five plus years out, so we've got two that are closing, two that will be a relocate, so I would guess that's after it relocates, it's closed. So five plus years out, you've got those four properties, and then we would be divulging ourselves from, correct? Selling the, those properties, is that what would normally be the plan? Yeah, no, it would be the plan, because one of the things that we know that we can't continue to operate I think we had 60 facilities right now. And as you continue to add facilities and not take away facilities, then that means that the general fund has to take care of most of those. So we, we, want, a, we want a healthy balance. We want to make sure that we're adding, but we're also taking away these facilities that's costing us a lot of money. Because, again, like you said, we're looking at Rice Creek. Rice Creek does have land. However, it was not part of our initial plan, but now we got to go back to address that. So 
those funds got to come from somewhere. So what we what we're advocating is some of the facilities that is costing us a lot of resources from an operational maintenance standpoint. Look at repurposing those facilities to do something else with them or close them. Ms. Hall. Um, two things. Uh, the big elephant in the room, of course, is the relocation of the central office. I'm not ready to tackle that today because I have a lot of emotions about that. Although I will say, um, could we envision City Hall being um, further down on Bay Street somewhere, around Joe Turner Drive or somewhere? Could we imagine City Hall being anywhere other than where it is in the center of our civic life? So to me, the 208 relocation is not just a expense consideration. It has a lot of cultural and uh, political uh, baggage with it. So I'm not ready to tackle that, although I see Ms. Hayden coming back up, so I guess I did. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I took a call from Linda um, Singleton this morning as I arrived to this building. So let me have you imagine the fact that the ladies' restroom on the second floor that has three stalls and only one of them is working. So the question for me was, do we quarter that one off? Um, and I was my response was, let's get a plumber, let's have them take a look at how we can work as expeditiously with very little funds that are allocated for the upkeep of that building. Um, some of the pictures that I received today is Wednesday, so the pictures I received Monday when I was out that we had back up and needed to have another plumber, not from our staff, but we had to outsource those particular services to come in. So there are specific needs that must be addressed in that building. Let me, let me cut off this conversation because we've had this 47 times, but let me just say that I think we're gonna, this is gonna be an agenda item at exact next Wednesday. Okay. Um, we're gonna talk about this a little bit. Oh, good. There's some, okay. there's some thought processes yeah. about. Yeah, I didn't want to get into it yeah. today, but. Yeah. But you did. Yeah, but right. so the, actual, so, the actual remarks I wanna make are about the underutilization of some of our schools and the fact, and this is for Dr. LeBet, I want to pick her brain as much as I can over the next few months. Um, as the East Floss funding helps to ease somewhat our general funding, what is the likelihood that we could use some of these spaces to create some pre-K programs? Because that's something to me that's essential, that we have to get more four-year-olds started in school. The state is not cooperating, so that would fall on us. But gradually, as we're able to put more things on the East Fly side, couldn't that help our general fund be able to fund more pre-Ks? Because then that would change this whole thing. Um, like Garrison, tell, I think at Garrison there's one pre-K. Well, we need four pre-Ks here. If there, is there space here? Can we have four pre-Ks here? So what is your thought about that? Well, I think everyone in the room understands that we need more early childhood experiences. Pre-K, based on the way the state allocates it, leaves it all up to the lottery. And I think anyone who is a um, citizen understands the need for quality child care. We don't have even quality child care in the county. So that's the one thing we can get behind. I believe that in the plan that we'll present, we will have buildings that can be repurposed to increase the opportunity for early childhood education. It does not mean it would be state funded. It means we would have to raise the money, much like we've done for the Acorn Academy that's private money that we are able to, you know, to raise. But we need like 30 acorn academies. If we have the space, we are half the way there because then we're only managing the operational cost and the cost of the personnel. So I would like to see as a member of this community and a strong advocate 
almost obsessive advocate for um, early learning that we consider and we will recommend the use of some of these buildings that we can repurpose and allow our young people to have experiences, even if we are um, maybe even assessing a small fee to families, because it would be infinitely less than they would pay on the market. Um, I do think that it is our moral obligation as a teaching and learning organization who is an extension of the child care enterprise to use our resources to provide high quality child care and education for our children. So I'm always going to advocate for that, Ms. Hall. And I do think we have an opportunity to be a model for other people. When I have an opportunity to talk to my colleagues and say we have an Acorn Academy, we serve 22 kids, but we need to serve 222. And I think we have an opportunity to do that. Through our development skills, we provide a lot of money in this community for lots of people, lots of, lots of companies. So why not go back and ask them to support one class, to support two classes? That's where we need to put our emphasis. And while we may not get capital outlay, if we can preserve the space and raise the money for the operational expenses, it will provide a valuable experience for our children, great service for our families, and also contribute to you know the, the wealth of our community. So I would advocate that we take a look at this list, think about how we can repurpose those buildings for that reason, but also make a commitment to get our own money since the state is not moving in that direction. As we go through this process, um, we're all going to identify, oh, there's excess budget funds here or empty buildings there, and there are lots of good ideas out there. Um, the board's going to have to coalesce. Team 10 is going to have to coalesce about around here are the principles and policy initiatives we're all going to agree on as we go through this process of overhauling our space, divesting of space. Um, so those conversations have to happen early and often. So the policy goals are on the front burner, and I, I think early childhood is definitely one of those. But bigger picture, the question I have for y'all is, there's some buildings I didn't see in the report or in here, like Old Thunderbolt, Old Hodge. What other buildings or facilities do we have as a district that are not in these reports? And as we go through this process of making recommendations about what to do with spaces, I think every single piece of property we own or lease needs to be on the list, number one. Number two, y'all have heard me for years complain about the lack of a budget for ongoing maintenance. Um, and everyone gets concerned when we see the red and the pink in these facilities reports. It's because we have, as someone said, 60 plus buildings um, and we're playing catch up. We're not, we're not maintaining, we're not ahead of the game. We got a lot better, I will say. Current leadership, when they came in, we've gotten much, much better about monitoring and being proactive. But the board's responsibility is to provide funding and policy direction to take that initiative. It's don't, don't put your finger in the dike, it's make sure the dike is built so the water's not coming through. And, we, and I'm, this is not a knock on current leadership. It's, a, it's actually a praise and a compliment to current leadership. We've gotten much better about identifying issues and being proactive, but the board needs to do better in terms of budgeting and setting policy goals, including on property management. And I'm a little concerned that I only see two closure recommendations and there's a lot of repurpose, relocate. Again, we have to have the ongoing policy decisions and the geography decisions and the programming decisions, but we're going to be in the same place we were, we are now and we were five years ago when we do a facilities condition assessment. If all we do is move, move computer support from arts to somewhere else, um, we need to really consolidate our buildings so we're spending less on managing 60 plus properties. And I, I'd like us to personally be more aggressive there so we can then properly maintain and be proactive with the other buildings. 
The other issue is, to your point, Dr. Howard Hall, I'm freaking out about what's happening on the west side. Every day I'm listening to the news when I'm getting ready in the morning, and it's a new supplier has announced a 900-employee facility investment in Rankin. That was this morning. You know, where are they all going to live? Some, I mean, I, I, I drive to Atlanta three times a month, and watching that space be developed right across the county line just scares me even more. Here's our problem. Our entire general fund budget is taken up. We have like 6% discretion on spending, maybe 10%. We have East Blossed. We have three more years of our current East Blossed. We can't repurpose those monies. So up at Savannah Chatham Day, I already, I, I spoke to several of our General Assembly folks and said, you guys are pumping money into economic development in Western Chatham County and Bryan and Effingham, but what are you doing for infrastructure? Okay, uh, we're happy to serve all these families and kids that are coming, but we don't have the funds. All of our East Boss money is earmarked for the next three years. You know, can, can we, do we, we need to contact the General Assembly and ask for some economic development discretion in repurposing our money so we can, we can maybe repurpose some of our projects. But we need to be thinking about those kinds of things now because you see how, I mean, We've been talking about replacing Windsor Forest in E4. It's going to be th two years before that project, you know, we can move kids in. I mean, we should be building stuff out there right now. Hyundai said we're going to be pumping cars out in 2025. And so we need to, like, as part of this plan, repurpose facilities, aggressively close and consolidate so we have extra money that we can use for maintenance purposes. And then we need to come up with a plan for going to the General Assembly and the governor's office and saying, love the economic development, thank you for showing love to the coastal empire, but help us with the infrastructure as well. Yeah, but it's not focused like this. Yeah, it's not as... It's let us spend more on some academic things and, you know, it, it's... We go to them with a detailed, specific proposal that's focused, and it's not, it's regional. It can be Ch Chatham, Bryan, Effingham, Liberty, whoever is going to see the impact of this. If we go collectively and say, hey, we need help with infrastructure, and, and if you've got economic development money, great, give it to us. But loosen the rules on how, what we can do with East Bloss. Let us repurpose some of our plans, because the plans we made four years ago were pre Hyundai. And now we've got 9,000 jobs, et cetera, so. So thank you for so, your yeah. um, response and your observation, Mr. Cashman. If you look back on 67, page 67, you see the consultant's recommendations that were just as aggressive as your comments, and you see operations was not as aggressive. So we'll take the two, we'll mesh them together, and we'll come back with some aggressive Well, I will just say I am one board member, you so. Are. And we've got a CIC meeting here, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven board members. Um, but we need to get on on a common platform pretty quick mm -hmm. on where we want to be. And maybe it's this meeting and the next CIC meeting. Maybe it's a special set meeting where we discuss this. Maybe, maybe you all come up with your plan, and then we have small group meetings to flesh it out, and then we have a bigger I, I don't – however, whatever makes the most sense, but – we need to get on the same page pretty quickly, and we agree. Yeah, Mr. Moss and then Mr. Grabowski. Uh, let Mr. Grabowski go first. Mr. Grabowski. I guess if you're, if we're kind of venturing into that territory now, as far as the recommendations that we've been presented, I hear you when you you know, talk about a more aggressive closing and maintenance and so forth. But I think we also have to be mindful that. Many of these schools are neighborhood schools that if we close and sell, we will never, ever, ever have the opportunity to get those schools back. And I think the value of those neighborhood schools, particularly if they are repurposed for early childhood education where they become more accessible to our families, particularly our families that are most in need, we have to look at that long-term value of what these facilities can mean for us as a district, even if it places 
constraints around our cash availability right now and look at innovative financing. So I just want us to be, I agree 110% on the maintenance. We've got to be proactive. We need a maintenance schedule. We need a replacement schedule that as a board, we understand what the cost of that is annually and we're able to budget it successfully. And that before we go into these new school programs and new, that we're are continuing to evaluate that life cycle cost of what it takes to operate, maintain a building. So I absolutely agree on that. I just, I like that a lot of the recommendations are for repurpose because I do think that that gives us opportunities to be innovative with our educational programming. It just means we have to be innovative with our funding as well. And we have the luxury of a lot of our buildings have been repurposed for non-academic uses. We have a lot of mm -hmm. auxiliary spaces. Maybe some of those can be consolidated and we can be more aggressive about what we do with them. So I, I hear you. We just all have to get on the same page about what we want to do. And until we get, I know Dr. Lovett and the team are working on a comprehensive recommendation. That's the point where we need to act quickly and decisively and kind of have a common plan moving forward. Mr. Moss. Okay. Um, uh, just a couple of observations. Uh, one on uh, the uh, westward westward expansion. Um, you know that is that that's where growth is. Um, you know I have uh, had me you know several meetings uh, with people from Pooler. Um, you know we have one elementary school there. Uh, that's an area that's that's growing. I mean, and um, the other challenge that we have, I, I, I understand redistricting, but we have a transportation problem. So unless we are building and expanding programs near neighborhoods where kids can walk or bike to school, unless we, you know, solve the transportation problem, we're still going to have an issue. I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to have all of these programs, but if the kids can't get to school, um, that's that's going to be a problem. But you know, as far as the westward growth, yes, and Hyundai's, you know, there there are going to be plenty of new rental houses because Hyundai has their people rent; they do not have their people buying houses. So, um, and you know, and there are about there's several thousand of them coming over. So, um, you know, let's look at the westward growth and let's prepare for that. But, uh, but let's also keep in mind that we have to do that growth in areas where the kids can get to the school and not be a further burden on our transportation system that, you know, I mean, everyone, and, and, and nationally, Every school system's having this, so we're not alone. But you know, when we're when we're working with builders and everything, let's have that that conversation as well. Is you know, make sure that we have sidewalks, make sure that we have uh, uh, bike lanes, make sure that when you're planning your new subdivision, that there's area for a school. Uh, and I've had a couple of those conversations, so. Um, but, you know, and let's look at the population. If the, the population is moving westward, if, if the, demogra and the demographics on the east side, if they're moving westward or a lot of them to the south side, let's just, let's, let's keep that data in mind and, and it's, it's smart growth, so. Thanks, sir. Oh. Dr. Lovett and Dr. Bringman. Yeah. I defer to Dr. Bringman first. Okay. Um, by law, how long does it take to close an academic building? I know there's a process. Yeah, so by, by law, you have to kind of advertise that you're going to close it, and then the board has to put forth a resolution. We send it to Georgia DOE, and they accept or deny it. Uh, I don't think they would deny it if you got a good plan. So uh, that's the process. Is that a couple months? Is that I know things things can go fast in Chatham County and go slow once they go out of Chatham County. Yeah, the great thing about it, we have a FCI that supports all our decisions that we're going to make. And so at this point in time, if the board wanted to bring a resolution to 
Georgia DOE say we want to close it, then we have all of the documentation that supports that. And so once you put forth the resolution, it goes towards the state. And it's, it's pretty quickly. Uh, we usually see that within two months. Okay. And non-academic buildings, we do not have to go through that process. Well, if we take the academic building and make it a non-academic building, we still have to get permission, just like Port Wentworth. They gave us, what, a couple of years, and after that they said that we would have to uh, take that out of our inventory. Okay, so to, like, if we wanted to put Whitney for sale, we would still have to go through the same process telling Georgia no, DOE? No, Whitney is considered a non-academic building, and so we don't have to do anything with that. And keep in mind, one of the other options is not to not just close and sell it could be closed and do a long-term lease so if we think population trends are going to swing back to the south side or back into the city or on the west side we can close a facility not operated as a school but lease it for 10 years with three five-year renewals with a two-year termination provision so we can hold on to the land if we want we have lots of options to hedge against what might happen 100 years from now or 50 years from now. We don't have to sell. We have, there, there are lots of creative ways we can do with our property. My goal is to minimize the M&O costs while maintaining all of our policy objectives at the same time. But Dr. Lev, just no, one ask for the comprehensive plan is how much available money do we, monies do we have that we could easily leverage for you know, the plan of the west side. Like, how easy is it going to be for us to strike a check to buy land if we decide in the plan to build? Yeah, and it, I mean, that's it. I think that's a budget issue, right? We know what the mandated salaries and TRS and benefits costs are, but whatever the discretionary spending is in the budget, we, the board, with Dr. Lovett's input, can, can certainly reallocate. Um, you know, more on the side, I know we could reallocate it, but what if by reallocating it, what are we, what are we, what are we, what are we losing? What, 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 what are we trimming right. that, and, yeah, and, and what, what does that trimming right. do to other programs? And the other option is we can tell communities in the west side and developers who are building houses, hey, we know we need to put schools out there. We have two ways of doing this. We can go buy land or you can give us the land that's going to help you develop or attract, but it's going to help you Garden City and Port Wentworth and Pooler and Rinkin and all all the communities out there. So let's do a public-private or public-public partnership that benefits your community and the district. You know, from, from from your mouth to their ears, because the ones I've spoken to are, how small can I build it, acreage, and how many houses can I shove in the land and. Uh, whatever school's closest will be overfilled, but the people that buy my houses aren't going to think about that when they're buying the house. Well, and some people are more altruistic and some are more financially driven. Um, I just want to remind everybody I have a beautiful building for sale for millions of dollars waiting for our coffers. Meet me at George Street and River Street and Thunderbolt, and we can take a tour. I just want to thank you for remembering all of the previous conversations we've had on this topic. And if you'll recall, I said it requires courage. It requires courage and bold thinking. Um, I can long remember in this very room when we presented for the budget, um, a maintenance, a kind of uh, ongoing maintenance uh, figure, and it was um, reduced greatly. So the staff will work on presenting um, a similar cost, and we would like to see support for that. That means something else is not going to be funded. And so we have to have the courage to say, if we're going to put aside the right amount of money to maintain these buildings, then we're going to have to have the courage to say no to something else. Um, there is a lot of conversation right now about impact fees. We need to jump on that. Um, there's a public conversation about it, even to the point that there's an editorial about it. And there was a time we couldn't even have a conversation in the city about impact fees. But I think everybody's coming to it. 
that impact fees need to be a part of it. I also think that we need to be in the front and do exactly what we've been discussing, saying to the developers, we need to have this space for schools. It is done in other states. We need to demand that, especially given this time period. And I also say that while the session, the General Assembly is in session right now, we know just about how much we're going to get done coming in at this point to have a conversation about the economic development funds that have been set aside. I think we need to use the rest of the session and the summer, which is when the work is done, to go in and talk about the changes to East Blast conditions and also the way that we can have get a piece of that pie around those economic development um, funds. I don't say we abandon the rest of the assembly period, um, but I say we make a concerted effort, put our plan together, and speak to our um, legislators because they are at least listening. We've seen evidence of that. So we want to take advantage of that, have someone carry the water on it. But what I've learned by working with the assembly over the last several years, we need a specific plan that they can push forward. I want to give them the language. I want to give them everything so that there is no confusion about what we want. We need to jump on impact fees. We need to make sure we get in there. We need to execute our own agreement with the developers coming in so that we can have that space available out there. And then there are some parts of this plan and the options that really are relegated to executive session. I've gotten a number of inquiries in the last several days about us selling Thunderbolt. And I think it might be because Ms. Hall says <laughs> beautiful space out there. But people take these statements seriously and then they, you know, jump in. I want to buy it for a dollar. I'm like, we ain't selling it right now. But even so, right, not for a dollar. But I do think these are great, rich conversations. I am encouraged because I hear the statements we've made over time about how to manage this inventory. Um, and I think we have the opportunity to thank you for agreeing for us to put forth a cost in the budget for deferred maintenance because that's what we're going to need. And it's not going to be six figures. It's going to be seven and could possibly be eight when you think about the buildings. So we need to make sure that you don't experience sticker shock on that, but it also means that something else has got to go. So we'll present something for your consideration in that area. Thank you for issuing that public invitation for us to do so. And then I think we need to come together as a group and decide how we're going to manage our presentation to um, State Assembly uh, representatives on our particular needs as it relates to um, infrastructure and um, meeting our housing and schooling needs in our community. Um, and and uh, I, I echo the, the uh, superintendent. Um, uh, as far as working with the home builders, I think working with home builders is just like working with the state legislature. If we can come up with, here is our ideal plan We'd like to work together with you. Uh, I think it's a selling thing. If you want to sell houses, people want to buy houses near their school. We're we're provide we're going to provide you. You know, one of the biggest drawing cards you're ever going to have with your your subdivision. Now, this is what we want for you. But I think we need, we need to be very specific in what we can do, and be able to make that offer and, 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 and be um, very proactive about it. You know, find out who is the builder that's building the most houses on the west side. Let's go to them and say, okay, you just bought up all this land. This is what we need. I don't know how many acres, this is that, this is how many acres we need. You go to six acres? We're going to build a school. You can now go back to the people, your investors on this subdivision going, this subdivision is complete. 
with a school. So, um, but thank you. More, more importantly than the developers, it's the municipalities yes. who give them building permits, and we need to work with them to say, um, you know, let's put this in your approval requirements, the infrastructure impacts. So we, we need to reach out to the municipalities out there and talk collaboratively about what they envision for their long-term plans, what our role is in that, mm -hmm. and how we minimize costs on taxpayers. So, Ms. Grabowski, then Dr. Howard Hall, then Ms. Hall. Um, piggybacking on Dr. Levette's comment about impact fees, currently impact fees cannot be collected by schools or for schools in Georgia. Um, so if we are going to uh, move forward on that, I would suggest that we also reach out to GSBA, and now is the time to do that. Dr. Howard Hall and I both received the correspondence from GSBA about the legislative positions, and we need to have those submitted to GSBA no later than April, um, and that needs to come from us as a board. So if that's something we want to move on, then we need to have a resolution in support of changing state legislation to allow for impact fees for schools. Um, and I think that would certainly be a wise move and something that hopefully other districts could support as well. It's not just that, though. It's we pay them as well. And we've had negotiations with municipalities about you're going to charge us what to hook up to water. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the other issue. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a definitely a, the whole infrastructure conversation is, is very complicated. But if we're talking specifically about impact fees, state law has to be changed first for us to even have that option. There has been a lot of talk on the west side regarding building a high school. I've heard a lot of talk from the Port Wentworth uh, municipality as well as Pooler. So have, has anyone contacted you regarding that? Has there been any conversation regarding putting a high school on the west side be it, between land that maybe um, that we have in Port Wentworth or Pooler? Because there's a lot of talk about it, but I'm not sure has the city managers from those municipalities have actually contacted you guys regarding this, another high school, because currently Groves is pretty much at, at capacity. Once we build our K-12 school, we, you know, that's, that's already at capacity. So I just thought I'd ask that question regarding the high school on the west side of town. As always, uh, we're looking at, we're looking five years out, so we're looking at growth. And so we have engaged with a real estate broker, and we are looking at large tracts of land on the west side and large tracts of land throughout the county uh, because uh, we recognize that you know it's a lot of building going on and so uh, a high school takes gross is 42 acres and so we're looking at whatever large tracts of land is out there so the, the answer to your question yes we have engaged into with the broker and we are looking at large tracts of land, not only for high schools, elementary schools, and middle schools. Ms. Hall. Um, very briefly, Dr. Levette was speaking about the fact that we need courage. What we also need is skilled staff. We can't do all these wonderful things we're talking about with that group of people right there. They'll be dead. They can't do it by themselves. They need skilled staff. So that's something. Dr. Levette, I hope you will begin to advance with your cabinet and all. Where do we get the people who know how to execute these things that we're trying to do so that we can keep our leaders here um, coming to work <laughs> and healthy? Yeah, but um, I, I look at capital projects and uh, I don't, you know, you look at all of this and you say, how can they do it? So they need help, and I think we need to um, advance that as soon as we can. Thank you. Okay, so to sum everything up, uh, we got a lot of courageous conversations to have in the near future. Uh, Dr. Levet and facilities are putting together a comprehensive plan, um, and the board's going to have to make some tough decisions sooner rather than later. Right? Sooner. Sooner. All right. With that, uh, let's move on to the program schedule. I forgot why we were here. Thank you. I have probably uh, 50 slides to go through, so. But you're going to go, uh, I'm going to echo Dr. Buck. You're going to go through them quickly. <laughs> um, no, I'm not doing it that way. All right.
right. Our program schedule, we, we uh, put this in the, uh, the presentation. You can certainly take a look at it. Um, just want to mention that there are right now 66 individual projects that we have scheduled. And these are in construction, design, and uh, still in planning yet. So the majority of this work still is to perform. But it does show that we are going to be touching the majority of the schools with either HVAC, with roofs, with uh, refinishing work, uh, and certainly our new schools and, and our additions. We did talk a lot about these, uh, about the financing. This is our spend plan cash flow for E3. And again, it does show that we have about $160 million to spend yet in E3, but the majority, or 50% of that, is the K-12. And so the rest of those projects are all scheduled. They're all uh, in, in design or in construction. And we would anticipate that by the end of 2024, we ought to be very close to closing up in, in ending uh, E3. E4, I think the thing that I want to point out is look under the SPLOS proceeds for 2022, and you see $118 million. And we talked about that also, how that is so much larger than what the budget was. Uh, look at 23, 24, 78, 80 million. So yes, collections have gone up substantially. Those additional dollars are being put into the construction above. So as you look at that cash flow, you start seeing we're going into the negative in 2025 now. Um, and we talked about that before. We're just tracking this. It's uh, something that we need to be aware of that we don't spend more than what we bring in. However, with the additional increases that we had in proceeds in 22, and not planning those additional increases in 23 or 24, but obviously as they occur, we'll be able to offset that, that negative dollar. But we are putting inflation into these costs now, and we are making these costs closer to the actual costs that we expect to see at bid time from either our construction managers or the other projects that we, that we uh, bid. Capital outlay is coming very well. Uh, that 2019 pending payment of 232000 is for Jenkins. And in the March board, you will be uh, approving the final certificate for that project, we're doing the final payment now, and so we would expect to have that received in two months. And in 2022, that 38,000 that's remaining uh, in capital outlay is New Hampstead. So again, that project should uh, be able to get completed and we'll be able to collect full payment for all capital outlay that we had through 2022, and then we're working off into the, the, the future ones here, 21, 22. But again, we have uh, close to 21, 22 million dollars of capital outlay that, um, that we have pending payments uh, on, and we just have to complete that work. As far as the programs, uh, the projects themselves, the K-12, again, the thing that we want to stress here is that we still have work to bid out yet. We have to bid a demolition package. That is that old building, the annex building that needs to be removed in order for the stadium to be built. And then we're repackaging this other work that was removed from CPPI's contract. And so that work is all going to get ready and go out for bid also. Um, schedule completion right now, I have uh, to be determined. Um, we've been evaluating this very carefully. Um, our architect has provided information that say 
The con contractor is 3.7 months behind the schedule that he provided us just recently. And that schedule had a TCO or a temporary certificate of occupancy date of June 28. Um, so we're getting information that yes, we are behind that schedule and that's all being evaluated. What? Uh, this year. Uh, this year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Harbaugh. My question is, the K-12 schedule completion, is, is that talking about the entire, is, is to be announced? Could you be specific with it? Because I know you have the entire campus when you include the ball fields and the stadium, yeah. and then there's the school itself. We took a tour last week, and it was awesome. We, there's a lot of progress that's been done. It's going to be a phenomenal um, facility. But there's so much work to be done, and I'm trying to figure out when will that work be completed. Because, and you just mentioned that it is 3.7 months behind. So it was originally to be um, completed in June? There was, of this. A, there was an original, uh, it's called temporary, or it's called the TCO, the Temporary Certificate of Occupancy Date. And that was to be on the building, the K-12 building itself. That was to be June of uh, this coming year, uh, 2023. That is, the, that is uh, the schedule that is being analyzed. And again, we got information from our architect that they see that being at least three, 3.7 months behind. And when you walk through the building, there's a lot of work to do, obviously. So we're looking at September? That would be, yeah, correct. So the, and remember, the only work that the contractor has is the building itself and, and the parking lots, okay? The stadium, uh, all the other ball fields out along the back towards the railroad tracks, all of that work has to be bid yet. Mm -hmm. So that work is definitely going to go into a completion of 24. Uh, and so when we get that work bid out, that's, that's all got to go under, you know, under construction yet. So, we, so the work that the contractor is doing is just the building itself, okay? So that's when we start talking about those dates, it's just the building itself. But all the other events around it and things will be out in the... 2024. If we're going to bid out demolition in March of 23 and then the stadium field house the fields construction, does that mean we have a signed agreement with Garden City now? Miss <laughs> <laughs> Hall? Um, meet people in the grocery stores and get the questions and all. I think we should be fair with uh, capital projects and just let them know that the whispered consensus among board members is that we will have children going into the school in January of 24. So, um, you know, we'll work through all of this under advisement and all of that, but we just want you to know that what we, at least I'll say for myself, is we're actually saying. I, I would just, I would suggest that they will not be moving into the school, perhaps, yes. <laughs> at the time that we had agreed. Yes. Um, and the future move-in date will be yes. determined. <laughs> now, I don't want people to go away from this meeting saying, oh, exactly. January. Yes. But we will just say we'll keep you apprised. Yes. <laughs> Windsor Forest High School replacement. Project is in design. They're putting together the GMP documents right now. J.E. Dunn uh, will be putting these early bid packages, and we're looking at the site work, the foundations, the structural steel, all of that. They're going to be putting out for uh, bids coming up here in February, March. Um, we will most likely have a component change order 
ready for the April board on this project, and that will release that work for the, the site work that we need to have in some of these uh, earlier uh, bid packages. One thing that we are studying quite closely right now is this temporary parking. Obviously, the building is going to remain during the construction, but the parking lot is going to need to be taken over by the contractor. In fact, the new building is going to be constructed on that parking lot behind the school. And so in order to keep the building up and running, we need to have parking as much as what we can get. And so we're looking at the amount of parking that we're going to be able to make there, looking at where we can provide supplemental parking and how we can get students, staff, whichever it may be, uh, to the school. So all of that is, is in progress. Obviously, this becomes a, a, a very uh, difficult logistics issue and a phasing issue as far as getting this summer work started so that the school can remain in, in, uh, in progress and that it can open again for school in August to have the parking and to have all of the infrastructure that's required so that the construction can, can keep going. So as you see, the new building pretty much lays behind the old building, and then there's a new parking lot that needs to be constructed in the fields. So uh, this project, uh, also I wanted to mention, we uh, had on a previous slide, yes, the, the budget has gone up to $92 million based upon the costs that our construction manager is coming back to us with. And as we showed on that cash flow for E4, those dollars that are being collected in addition to what was the budget are going to be brought up into projects. And one of the projects that is going to be increased budget-wise is the Winter Forest High School, so that this project uh, can remain and can keep going. You've seen the, uh, the renderings of it before we put these in again. What is the uh, bleacher capacity going to be for the fields? It, it's going to be, if you look at Jenkins, that's what it's going to be. That field in Jenkins, have a problem with Jenkins. is going to be. I should have been more vocal back be then. pretty much the same. So what, what's the bleacher capacity? Do we know? <clears throat> The bleacher capacity at Jenkins is 500 seats. Basically, uh, it is designed for soccer. Uh, it's not designed for a competitive football field, and so that's the capacity of it. Uh, when you get into capacity of uh, bleachers, uh, what comes in play is plumbing and restrooms, and that is what the city requirements make us do. Uh, if you put the capacity out there of 1,000, then you've got to have the restroom to support that. And typically, uh, on that particular, we're landlocked by not having enough space to put all of the restroom amenities that have to go along with that. So we can put them out there, but it would never get permitted because we don't have the plumbing spaces for men and women restrooms. You've got to have that. We're spending $92 million. I think we can find space and money for more bathrooms. We've got a gym there that's already got bathrooms. We're adding a a uh, field house there. Uh, I'm just going to say my, my problem with Jenkins, our design guidelines 10 years ago, the board said we want every school to have their own athletic facilities, arts facilities, music facilities. It creates school spirit. Um, it creates a sense of community. I'm, I, I've been disappointed in Jenkins because you can't have, you can only have some competitive sports there, not others. The teams have to travel. We have this brand new multi-million dollar school and they have to go elsewhere for some competitive sports. I don't want to keep making that mistake. I'm one board member. Um, if we need to put in 30 extra bathrooms, let's do it. Um, we did it at Islands, we did it at Savannah High, we're doing it at Groves. Winter Forest should have, I, I'm trying to remember what the minimum is, 1,500 or 2,000 so you can host non-playoff lacrosse, soccer, track, and football games. 
Um, and I know there's space issues, but if it's just a bathroom issue, I mean, I see lots of empty space on this plot where we can add bathrooms. So I'm one board member, and I don't know if anybody else cares, but I do. Um, and I'd like us to reconsider the, the bleacher situation there so we can have some competitive sports there, and they don't have to travel to Memorial or Jennifer Ross to, to play sports. Yeah. We, we have taken that into consideration, but we, we will get from the city the bathroom count. And so we had a choice to reduce the FTE of the school to get it down lower to create the space or have bathrooms on it. And so uh, if you look at uh, Windsor Forest, it does not have everything in the design guidelines that we want. There's some things that is just not going to be there. And so we made that known very uh, upfront that we cannot do everything in design guidelines. But we will go back and we will get the permitting uh, information from the city that requires if you have a public space, how many bathrooms are going to go in there. And we'll get the architect to put together a ladder for us. So this might be too much in the weeds, but so is it a city requirement or is there a state building code requirement that is a part of that as well? It is a city building code. If you have a public space, you have to provide bathrooms for those people that are coming into your space. Okay. That's women bathrooms. Okay, that's men it was city or state. It was city. Quick question. Uh, you said that the budget went up to 92. Uh, what was it originally, just for the sake of conversation? Yeah, about 68, right? 68. Yeah. I mean, we, we've had the discussion. The, the big problem here, Sean, is 23 acres? Is it even 25? I don't, I don't, know. I don't think, think it's 25, but yeah. yeah. Um, it's Savannah High. That's a city building requirements. Yeah, we had the space. That's, that, that's, that space is over 40 acres. Be, be, it wasn't done at Beach, and Beach is... 40, I was just doing the same as it's like 44 acres. It's, it's, it's taken three iterations just to fit the Jenkins track on there. I mean, I, I get where you're coming, but uh, um, um, unless some, yeah. we, we want to take some homes down. 300 bathrooms, that's a problem. But let's, let's figure out what exactly the city would require. And if it required, and if that option is for us to reduce the FTE is what I'm hearing, we reduce the FTE for... Bathroom. We can't we can't reduce the FTE anymore. We're already reducing the FTE from what they are at now. Yep. Let, let's just know what the numbers are. We're talking in theory right now. No, we can but, have an architect provide yeah. the numbers. We'll get the analysis. Staff will confirm in writing what the requirements are. I think if you put it in writing, let everybody see it, and then if people can make something happen, make something happen. We're operating based on what we've been advised, so. Just put it in writing, and then I think we'll be good. Yeah, I think if you look at this site plan, it starts really showing how tight um, those athletic fields are. With the new building, the way that it had to be kind of compressed in there in order to keep that existing building uh, functioning. So that does start pushing a lot of uh, our athletic fields and buildings and it's very, very, very tight in space. Um, so. um, I have a question. Uh, Sean just made me aware of it. So we are uh, providing space for music, theater, uh, band at all of our high schools, correct? Yes, that's correct. That's part okay. of the programs. So what I have noticed, and I noticed this at Gross, it's a great auditorium. It's a great auditorium. It is not a theater. There's a difference between an auditorium and a theater, and it has to do with stage space. Right now, we have one school with a theater, and that's Savannah Arts Academy, because you have to have the wing space, you have to have the fly space. It's, 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 it's the, the depth of the stage. If we're saying that we are doing a, a theater space, in music space, let's do real, I mean, and they're great auditoriums. Please understand, they're great auditoriums. 
they're, but they're not. So if, if, for instance, if Jenkins wants to do a musical, the space that we have now is not conducive for those kids to have a real musical because there's not enough fly space for, for scenes. Uh, there's not enough depth. So um, just something to look at. Okay, thank you. And next is Bloomingdale. And we got a lot of discussion about this as far as uh, accommodating the, the future growth, looking at replacing the existing school with a 1,000 FTE school. This is still early in uh, preliminary design yet, but this is one of the initial concepts that, that Buckley had come up with, and they're still working through this yet, finding out the best way to handle traffic, um, parent pickup and, uh, and drop off, queuing buses, and also the building itself to accommodate the area that's, uh, that's needed for this program. Uh, still uh, targeting to have a demolition package ready for this summer. Godly Station, we are putting together the bid document to go out next month, hopefully about the second week in March. Um, last time, I think I told you that we were we had a problem. We ran into a problem with the sewer line uh, in along the back of the school, an existing sewer line. It looked like when we had to relocate that, we would have to put in a lift station. Well. We pulled that back and, and went out and did more surveying, more studying, more engineering, and came up with a solution that does not require that lift station. Um, the positive is we saved over $300,000. The negative is we lost a couple of months in the schedule. However, I think that's a, that's a pretty good um, change for it. So. This project now is ready to go out to bid. Uh, we will not need to do uh, the lift station. And so we should have this ready for contract award in, uh, in the May <coughs> board. Uh, just a quick question going back to Bloomingdale. I see demo scheduled for late 2023. Where will students go when that school's under construction? Do we know that yet? We are, we are looking at putting them over in the new uh, Hampstead K-8 school. That school has well over 50% capacity yet, and there would be available area to move that school over there and put it in, in that school. Okay, and just one, I know the site plan is still under design, but I would implore us to whenever possible to minimize children walking to school having to walk through a parking lot because right now that's the way it's designed so. mm -hmm. okay. we got Dr. Howard Hall it's just a question for Mr. Um, Cashmore if time permits could we have Mr. Foreman to just provide a, a quick um, report on LNWBE's participation and what's going on with um, with his portion as being the liaison let's see uh We've got some slides to go. Let's see where we are. I'm sure Mr. Former, you can do a 30 second summary. <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> the Pulaski Elementary School edition that's needed in order to convert this school to a K 8. Uh, once again, our architect is completing the documents, the GMP documents, and this project is through the construction manager. We'll be going out to bid in uh, in the next couple of months, also. And one thing that has to happen this summer is the construction of this parking lot that would allow uh, this area to be used by the contractor for lay down areas so that they can construct the addition. Uh, 
that existing gymnasium is going to be converted in the uh, in the work also. But obviously, where it's located, it's going to make it very difficult for the school to use that for the upcoming year for PE. And so we're discussing that with the school also. Savannah Arts the project is under construction. That new cafeteria is, uh, is coming along right on schedule. You can see a picture of it there. Roofed. Um, they're putting the enclosures in, mechanical and electrical. Uh, that will be completed uh, in uh, four or five months and will be ready for use in August, uh, coming up in, uh, in 23 for the school year. And then the interior renovation work, lots of painting going on, uh, acoustical ceiling panels being put in. Uh, finishes, technology, and uh, just just updating all of those classrooms, working through those uh, in, in classroom groups, and they're coordinating very, very well with, with the school. Coastal Middle School, this one, the renovation work for the cafeteria and for the restrooms is pretty much complete. Got some, just some pictures here of what they're looking at as far as the finished product is concerned. Uh, they just have to work through some punch lists and closeout items. Uh, the e-learning academy is still in programming yet, very early design. Uh, we mentioned that this program had been looking at a few different places to be located. And now uh, the Mercer School, the old Mercer School building is where we are focusing our, our attention for this program to be uh, placed. Number of projects and renovations. We uh, have uh, you know, design started in a lot of these, planning, but these are our immediate projects that we're taking off on uh, right away here in 2023. The interchange court, again, this was mentioned, that there was paving that was completed out there, and now this facility uh, for the bus drivers with new restrooms and a training area is also under construction. Uh, you see the masonry going up and by April that will be ready for uh, use. HVAC projects, a number of schools uh, that are uh, going to be having new systems installed. And again, a little bit about where we're at with these schools as far as the ones that are going to be under construction this summer, putting in new HVAC units and still in design and a number of them in planning and, and the schedule for those. Roofing, the same thing. There's a couple of projects that are bid, ready to be uh, awarded soon. Um, those projects in design, too, they're, they're going to be bid out and scheduled for work starting this summer, too. So all of these projects are all ongoing and, and uh, all in various phases. Um, schools are still uh, having these security enhancements done yet. We have eight schools now in construction or design. And the artificial surfaces, we have an RFP on the street right now for replacing five of the high school's practice fields with artificial turfs. Uh, those RFPs are due in on March 9. And there'll be an award, and we'll get uh, those started this summer. As far as synthetic play surfaces are concerned, those playgrounds, White Bluff is completed, and we're looking at our schedules and what our sequencing will be for, uh, for future ones. And in Georgia Power, we have a few slides in here for their projects uh, and, and looking at what those savings and rebates are. These LED projects that already have been completed, you know, there, there's, there's savings of $856,000 associated with that. 
along with that $480,000 of uh, rebates. And so there's a number of projects that are going to be completed in 23, um, as we have listed here. That these projects do have a huge environmental impact. And I, I think this slide really is, uh, is it really tells the story real well. Those kilowatt savings that you see, 8.9 million kilowatt savings, and, and what, that, what that impact would be as far as the savings in carbon dioxide, in, in uh, cars driven, uh, forests that would be uh, used up in the amount of coal. So by all those savings that are being made just with LED lighting, um, it, it has a huge impact on the environment. Our other projects that we still have ongoing at Savannah High, the installation of that solar system grows, of course, is going to have that roof mounted solar system panel. And, and again, those impacts, environmental impacts expressed uh, there in that uh, slide also. And then those EV electrical vehicle charging stations, again, just the status of where we are at with those. In terms of costs and savings, we used to track, here's what our annual cost per square foot is. Um, we had that data when we did our presentations related to East Blast. Um, as we do our, as you all do your facilities recommendations uh, and a comprehensive plan for us to consider, can we get updated numbers for that? Because um, I think that will help us gauge what our budget costs will be for all of our facilities and what estimated savings might be. And that'll help inform the discussion. Okay. Any questions, Mr. Huntington, before we move on? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Um, I like the demo, I like it lots. I'm Jay Jones, uh, Executive Director of Capital Projects. I'm Nicole Calhan, Senior Director in Capital Projects. This morning we are going to give you a very brief, uh, very brief. introduction to the Systems Integration Project, of which you guys have allocated about $12 million for East Class 4. Um, we're also going to talk about and arm one of the means in which we execute that project, audio enhancement. So without further ado. Across the nation, all of us are looking for opportunities to improve and enhance the classroom itself. So when we are investing in technology, we are looking for things that are impacting the teacher and the students every single day. From a very common sense perspective, if our kids can't hear, they can't learn. Our teachers spend a lot of time trying to raise their voice to reach everyone. You're interacting with students, lots of reading, lots of conversation. For years, it's always been given instructions multiple times for kids to be able to hear me. We wanted some way to overcome that, to put in a sound system that worked. Really thinking through how improving students' hearing of what the teachers are saying in their lectures could increase their educational outcomes. We were able to pilot the audio enhancement system and we saw immediate success and results as well as a lot of application for the technology. Audio enhancement is a system where teachers have a microphone lanyard and speakers around the classroom. Teacher walks in their classroom, they put that lanyard on each day and they begin teaching. They can just talk in a conversational manner without really straining and trying to project that voice and the audio enhancement system does the rest for them. They're not worn out from trying to manage students. They can do that with a microphone that reaches everyone. Kids are able to better participate in classroom instruction because they can adequately and accurately hear what the teacher is saying. The kids in the classroom now are better behaved because they can hear better. Utilizing audio enhancement, my students have an opportunity to speak with confidence and to speak in front of their peers. Everyone wants to be a part of the conversation so students become active participants in the learning process as a result of that audio equipment. I've had some very shy students that 
I have offered the microphone to, and they want to add to the discussion when you allow them to have that extra piece for engagement, it really gives them a sense of confidence. The other part of it, though, is this idea of safety for teachers with the SAFE system. In today's climate, we're worried, we're concerned for our safety. The SAFE system is incredible if we have an issue in school. I can just press these two buttons instantly. Administration is notified. It gets direct communication from the teacher to the administration as needed. So if there's something going on, all they have to do is just simply press that little button, hold it for three seconds, and it sends a silent alert to the office. Yeah cameras in all of the classrooms, so immediately I will get an alert and I can push on it and I see a live video stream of everything that is happening there. With the safe alert, those few seconds that we always hear about on the news are saved with this technology. When we need to notify our staff of a lockdown or a different emergency, we need to ensure that the intercom works and works properly and is easy to use for the individuals dealing with that crisis. In the past, when I would go into my schools, I would constantly hear every announcement that was made. I'd be teaching and then I'd hear, psh, psh. <laughs> Epic has cleared all of those problems up. We now have the ability to target hallways, to target classrooms. The EPIC system is very straightforward. The system has a visual representation of the school. They can just touch a room to make contact with that classroom. It's nice, even from a safety standpoint, that I can make an alarm or I can make an all call from wherever I am. Our principals enjoy the fact that they can limit distractions throughout the day. Have student movement and at the same time make announcements, but only impact the students that we need. We even have what we call district view, which gives us the ability to broadcast out a message across the entire district if we need to. DuPath is the classroom camera system. When students are absent, we're now able to use DuPath to put them right in the classroom. Teachers can also go back and watch their instruction and how they delivered that to the student. They identify their weak spots and their strengths and then they improve their instructional techniques. So self-efficacy is built right into the use of the camera systems. They can also give somebody else permission to watch their lessons. That enabled me as the instructional leader the opportunity to go back and work with teachers who may have desired improvement in classroom management, instructional delivery. The effort was to be more effective, which doesn't necessarily require change. It requires improvement. And having DPAT afforded opportunities for that. From safety in the classroom to professional learning to providing a repository of best practices, I don't think you can find another tool that hits all of that at the same time. Teachers tell me that in their careers, it's the best educational tool that's ever been put in their hands. So one of the hallmarks of the systems integration project is aggressive inter interdepartmental collaboration. Uh, in the past, we would have uh, maintenance. So say, for instance, in 1982, the same intercom system that was installed at Larva Tibet Elementary School is the same intercom system that's sitting there right now when I was here a long time ago. Um, <laughs> maintenance, we used to have to send a team of maintenance personnel over there to get a ladder, climb up to the ceiling to adjust the speakers. Now we can, Nicole can adjust the speakers using district view uh, from our office on Hopkins. Uh, it is cost efficient and it also allows us to work really well with the with other folks within the, the school district. We work well with campus police, um, with access control. Mm -hmm. uh, information technology. Information technology. So now every month Nicole holds a uh, systems integration work working group, which brings all those folks together from academics, from campus police, from maintenance and operations, from information technology. We talk about all of our projects and then we collaborate so we can give our taxpayers the most big for their buck, the most punch for their penny. Uh, right now we've been able to remove about a $30,000 cost per school uh, through a project that campus police was going to do because these little devices right now do exactly what that, what that, uh, what that program was going to do for campus police. Just want to give you an example of what a 21st century collaborative classroom will look like. Um, you would have a 75 inch interactive view board that would connect to an amplifier and four classroom speakers. 
Um, you would also have the, they call it an educam, so that would be the camera that teachers would be able to use you pad to record lessons, to integrate tapes learning, um, upload it to Google Classroom, whatever their platform is that they're using. Um, you would also receive a teacher microphone. This would be their lanyard as well as their safety system. And then they have the student ball um, that students would be able to use to pass around, um, to be able to interact with the students and keep it fun. Uh, <laughs> yes, this, this is the, the ball that uh, uh, spoke of that she was able to put <laughs> at Jenkins. So, so it, it's durable. You can toss it around. Um, exactly. Yes. Mrs. <laughs> Hall was fascinated. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, oh, so it's on. So you can speak into it and, and your voice will amplify through it. So the microphone is actually built into uh, the ball. Test, test. test. <laughs> <laughs> I hope Dr. Yes. Brennan can't hear me. <laughs> It really is, will make a difference for kids who don't like to speak, yes. who are afraid to, yes. to speak. I have a child that is very shy. This and, gives them that yes. added confidence to do certain things. So Ms. Hall had her experience at the legislative breakfast. As she she was is. fascinated. She left <laughs> an hour after the breakfast was over yes. because she was intrigued by the system that we are implementing. exciting is that it's integrated. Yeah. So we have been able to record lessons before. We have used an audio enhancement system before. What makes this exciting is that it is all integrated. So a teacher has fewer things he or she has to do in order to enhance audio, to call for assistance. It's all in one place. And the camera above now is a part of the infrastructure and not something the teacher has to pull out and use. Uh, and one thing I have to comment on is for first year teachers, one of the biggest uh, things that happens to them is they lose their voice. And uh, as someone who teaches voice, this is, this is going, going to cut down on the number of sick days you're going to have from teachers. This is great. This is fantastic. Dr. Brennan? Yeah. Um, what are the, I, I, I love the plan. What are the price tags um, per year? Is this part of E, E4 and then into a possible E5, or is this coming somewhere else budget wise? So, so glad you asked the question. So right now, on average, uh, it costs about $500,000 per school. Uh, you know, some schools are going to be less, some are going to be more. Uh, this will get us a little bit more than halfway through the district. Uh, we're still going to have to have some funds coming from somewhere else to, to fund the, uh, the last two years of the program. The so $12 million will get us halfway through? Uh, approximately. So if we allocate 3 or $4 million a year over the next several years, we can get there? I'm glad you asked that question too. Um, actually, one wonderful thing that we, Javon actually was able to uh, go and meet. There, there are a number of costs associated. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have some cost savings um, there on the yearly license subscriptions. Um, as far as the technology is concerned. Um, our industry standard is to replace servers every five years. Um, a server is about $25,000. Um, so that would be a part of our life cycle if we did 10 schools, 10 replacement servers a year, that would be $250,000. Dr. Harbaugh? 
Oh, we're done. Well, I just so so that's replacing servers every five years. Is there an annual for the use of the technology fee or subscription or no anything like that? I'm Cloud just, storage space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where do we store all the data? So the data is stored in the cloud. The each teacher is each teacher is <laughs> each teacher has access uh, to the cloud to their own cloud. Um, that cost is built into the the cost the lifetime cost of our system. Okay. Doctor Howard Hall. Yes, I can see this as being beneficial for e-learning days. Um, God forbid if there's another pandemic or anything like that, or a hurricane, or if a student is out on long-term disability, they can have the access to those lessons. Um, so, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, every learning management system that we have here in the district, we've uh, gone out to Utah to make sure that they could test it out. Every learning management system we have in the district is integrated with the system. Okay. So the other question I have is, over the last several years, we've approved a lot of money for communication systems, new intercoms, police, you know, state-mandated um, emergency responder communication systems. Are we looking at all of those contracts we've approved already as part of the integration process? And I know you said earlier you saved 30 grand by getting rid of something the, the police department was going to do, but I'm just thinking back to all of the things we've approved in E3 that haven't been installed yet. I mean, are we integrating this system and getting rid of all the other things that we've approved um, so that we, we're integrated throughout the district? So there are a lot of life safety things that we cannot get rid of. Uh, so we have, there's an in integration component between the audio enhancement and the fire alarm, but the fire alarm has to stand alone. So Audio enhancement does not replace the fire alarm, but it gives you an interoperability with the fire alarm. So we can do things like uh, have a visual announcement that, hey, there's a fire alarm for maybe the, the, the uh, for some students who might be impaired. Um, we work closely with information technology. So say, for instance, in the past, we would have one speaker that was for the intercom. We would have two speakers that was for the audio visual. Right now, we've gotten rid of one of the uh, the, the receivers inside the classroom. Uh, so now it's all integrated. The intercom and the audiovisual receiver, they're integrated. The, inter the, the speakers are integrated. So we've taken a look at all of those things. We don't have all that information ourselves, but we talk to all of our counterparts in other divisions uh, to ensure that we're looking at all of the things that we've done in the past, as well as collaborating moving forward into the future. And so also part of our work group is that's how we realize how we can pool our, pool our resources in, in the projects that they're working on. And that was one thing that where really that cost savings came about was that from that work group, they were able to go to Chief and say, hey, Chief, Capital Projects actually has something for what you're looking for. And so we did a lot of demonstration for him, and he was all about it. So what I'm hearing, tell me if this is correct, anything where this technology supersedes old technology, where we're not spending money on replacing the old technology, we're putting in this new technology, and anything where we have to have a standalone system, this system will integrate with the standalone systems. Is that that's correct? where we're getting to. That's where we're getting to. That, okay. And that's the purpose of the working group, is it? So we're not spending money on the same thing that we didn't know. Yes. All right, thanks. Ms. Hall? I see here that uh, you've done a lot of installations I'm happy to see those. I understand that Woodville Tompkins is the showcase if, if we really want to see all of this in action, that they seem to be the most um, aggressive in getting this. So I'd like, like it if we could possibly get Woodville, to, Woodville Tompkins people here just for them to tell us um, their experience. But now, we've already put $12 million in this. Is that correct? $12 million is already funded. And we need twelve million more. Did the E four? Yeah. Okay. So, so we, we put twelve million in integration systems for E four. Yeah. Okay. So, do you have a recommendation of where the funding, or, or is that something Dr. Lefebvre would decide where the funding needs to come from, so that we can turn this from pending into an actual schedule? So, so I've had an opportunity to have some conversations with some of our academic folks. Uh, we've talked with, with maintenance and operations. We've talked with campus police. 
Um, there's a number of different ways that, that, that we can look at this. Um, so it is an academic tool. Um, it's proven to, uh, to decrease the gap, the gap in learning loss. So if there are funds available um, that would potentially be used for learning loss, this is something that I could do. And one of the uh, data points that they found was that just by having those four speakers in the classroom, it automatically increased test scores by 10%. Um, uh, outside I'm of that, sorry the, that there was the, the, here from Academic Affairs today, but um, I'm sure they are aware of this. Um, so you're saying that this would have to come from different departmental budgets? This isn't something the board could just... No, so right now we only have $12 million allocated towards this particular project. And so if the board wants to find additional monies, I think it's $13 million to complete the strategic plan that we presented in the brief. Uh, that would get us where we need to be. Mr. Bowski. Is it fair to say because of the multiple benefits that the system offers that there's opportunities for creative financing approaches and grants that we can pursue to help in the funding? I, I think that is perfectly stated. <laughs> it's also fair to say that we have some listed East Lost projects with excess revenue where the life cycle replacement costs might have exceeded what we originally budgeted, so there might be some East Boss funds available as well. Right. So if you take a look at our current, yes, if you take a look at our current installation schedule, uh, we have uh, two new schools, uh, New Hampshire K-8 and Jenkins High School, uh, where we were able to use some of the uh, construction dollars uh, towards those projects. Uh, we've also been able to use some funds, but not many, from other, other renovation projects because we are replacing those systems. Um, additionally, we have a, a lot of schools where, the, where there's almost catastrophic failure with the intercom systems, and because it's life safety, we're able to allocate dollars for that. Uh, we're, we're innovative, but it will take a lot more than the $12 million that we have currently allocated. Let's, let's flag this for budget discussions with the budget committee and the full board, but we, it seems like most of us are, this is in our priority list. So any other questions, Dr. Brink? I'm just following up on some of the stuff that uh, Mr. Cashmore is bringing up. Last month, well, actually this month, the beginning of this month, we approved uh, over a million dollars to access for security cameras in their installment. Will this system, <laughs> we've spent that money, so those cameras are getting installed. Um, does this system integrate with pre-existing cameras that we are going to have on the external portion of our schools? So this system is specifically designed with classroom cameras mm -hmm. for academic purposes. Okay. So there are, there are integration opportunities, but these cameras are specifically for academic purposes. Okay. And just on the safety question, if the teacher pushes it, those safety buttons. Does that work anywhere on campus? Yes. Okay. Um, so it, if they're inside their classroom, mm -hmm. the front office would get an acknowledgement and their classroom would, would light up bright red. If they were having to be moving around the building, it triangulates where they are and with the closest three to five receivers, and then there will be a bubble. So if they're constantly moving throughout the building, it refreshes and shows where they are on the map. So if they see something outside or they see something in the hallway, it will alert to their location. Yes, ma'am. Great. Is there training funding for this training for our, our people? In, in the um, installation budget, we do include training. We actually have a group of 10 SEC PSS employees at uh, training. We have about four of our instructional technology folks there, um, three of our academic coaches from Garden City Elementary in New Hampshire K-8. Um, and they're actually going through the week-long training to be, we call we have dubbed it our uh, audio enhancement champions for each school. So we are rolling out um, training where staff is able to come back and then implement these into the curriculum at their schools. And the principals have been super supportive with, with that initiative. 
Dr. Howard Hall. I want to say from instruction of point of view as a uh, former teacher, those um, audio balls can also be used for a classroom management tool. So you don't have to necessarily use them for the shy student, but for the student that's a talker and aggressive, that's an opportunity for that child to actually use the audio ball and, and when he takes, you know, raises his hand or um, does not disrupt. So it can also be used in that manner. Dr. Brayman's already broken that one. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Thank you so much for your presentation. Appreciate it. Um, that is it on the agenda. I'm going to ask Mr. Formey for his 30-second update on, uh, yeah, which, which actually means you got two minutes. Um, just give us, so, and, and before he, as, as he's walking up, I will say this. Um, I'll get with Dr. Levette and Ms. miller Kagler on when operations thinks they're going to have a more comprehensive plan. And we'll schedule a CSC meeting either for next month or the month after. Um, and maybe we can get a fuller report on LMWB efforts um, along those lines. But if you could give a brief update on efforts to date, including the meeting at Jenkins that was a few weeks ago or months ago. You're taking up all my time, sir. Go. <laughs> Go. For the first 45 minutes, I'll discuss uh, the G <laughs> Anyway, thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate you ending by saying that we're going to provide a more comprehensive report at a future meeting. I don't know whether it's the CIC or the board meeting. I'm looking forward to it. But I would like to I constantly remind myself, and uh, the folks in the uh, capital group also remind me that this is, uh, we've got to remember that 74%, we passed the East Block 74%. of a lot of voters expanded all around. Okay, we really appreciate that. So I pay particular attention to the L in the LMWBE part of it because it's been proven in previous years um, that local operators, even if they're subcontractors, they partner with and they sub to secondary tertiary arrangements. The good news is as we're getting rolling out here, uh, see, uh, see uh, Capital Group is about to grow hot and heavy but by placing bid opportunities uh, on the uh, uh, purchasing website and uh, other places. Now, word of mouth, I think I've been effective at uh, telling folks that we didn't have a lot of projects out yet, but we're coming and they're calling. And the event at Jenkins really does a great job. Uh, I'm inundated weekly with people that want opportunities uh, to do work in the system. One of the things I'm trying to do in this low in the past a few weeks or so is try to find out find folks in the non-traditional categories like HVAC. Uh, my leader here, Mr. Bozeman, uh, and I have to have a conversation about it because I do see a lot of opportunity uh, there going forward. Um, secondly, uh, the potential bidders for things to come are, are getting a message. You know, they're calling and saying, hey, you, can you help me pull some folks together? We've got this minority business requirement going on. And I'm doing that. And uh, I, I usually uh, react by saying, well, where do you want to use them? What are you bidding and where are you going to want to use them? So I'm getting a lot of emails from folks um, that are specifying where they're not going to self-perform uh, so that I can, we can research those opportunities. Now, at the Jenkins event, uh, we had slightly less than 100 folks, which is pretty good, because uh, I hear of other folks having things, and they may have 10 people, 15, 20 people, this sort of stuff. So the world's getting around that we're about to spend money, and uh, I hope to provide a more detailed uh, report in future meetings. Uh, I think you'll be pleased with the uh, number of operators Oh, I'd like to also say this. I want to thank the Capital Group uh, uh, managers of these projects for reaching out to me and saying we're contemplating doing this and putting it out on the, on the, on the web. Uh, so it's enabled me to uh, do a little bit of advanced work to try to include folks. So if you have any good individual questions, uh, I promise not to take any more than two hours when I make the, the, the presentation next time. That was three minutes, not two, Mr. Foreman. Well, I'm going to take that off your time next next meeting. Don't do it. Just put that in the minutes, please. Thank you. Other questions? Other questions? Any, Any quick questions, questions for Mr. Foreman? All right. We'll, we'll, we'll schedule you for a, a thorough presentation at our next meeting just so we can get an update. We haven't had one in a while. Yeah. We need statistical detail and that sort of stuff. Appreciate it. All right. Anything else for the good of the order today? 
All right, we'll get on this. We'll get on scheduling another meeting shortly, um, and we'll send an announcement out. And with that, we are adjourned. We're not adjourned. is leaving. If we need to have more of these meetings, I think that would behoove us to do that. That was a. That's been the tentative discussion to kind of front load meetings. This. This. Um, this first half of the year. But we also wanted to, we didn't want to set a meeting just to have a meeting. We wanted to have substantive projects completed so that superintendent and staff can actually say, Here, here's what we're recommending and we could have substantive discussions. So we're still working through that, but absolutely. All right, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you for your time today. We'll see you next time. <laughs>